Who are we seeing to? 27. For here? Governor wants him buried tonight. The dead, they say, comprehend everything. The old and now in all his glory. <clears throat> the late, not so very great. Abbe Ferrea. <coughs> Stinks in here. Never noticed. But what of the man forced to live as though dead? Huh? Oh, mother of God, he's heavier than he looks at each one. Which way round do you want to do this? Well, top of the head first. You hold the ends together and I'll stop stitching up the shroud here. What of the man, the living, scarcely breathing man? You ever think it's true? The treasure Abbe Faria said he had stashed. What of Edmond Dantes? What do you think? <coughs> Where's the weight? <coughs> You'd think you'd be stiffer in the limbs, wouldn't you? Bring the barrel over, please. Well, five hours is a long time. You get hold of the weight and all of his feet in first. <sighs> And then... The body. You come here today, my most honoured friends, and ask me to describe all I know of the cataclysm in Paris. Oh, what's what you're doing? I'm sorry, Swan. And now that a fitting and respectful time has passed, so as not to dishonour the insane and the dead, it is the Count's most solemn wish that I, Ide, his loved and trusted companion, now describe in every detail the events of that extraordinary year in Paris. Get, get, get the body back in the barrow. So that you may understand at last the meaning of the Count's actions. I'm trying. And comprehend finally the true nature of his wrath and revelation. That's more like it. But first, most honoured friends, you ask me to describe the situation of his birth. Yeah. Let's get rid of it. His pedigree and parentage. But I must say to you clearly, and I hope without rancour, that the character of the Count is forged here, in the bowels of the notorious Chateau d'If, with neither pedigree nor parentage to guide or protect him, when he is still poor, wronged Edmond Dantes. Imagine, though. Just imagine if Faria was right. The treasure of Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo is nothing but a pissing stop off Corsica. Uh, I'm getting way too old for this. Armed only with a righteous storm of vengeful fury, which rages now in his embattled and broken heart. Thunder now. Let's get this done, Swan. Ah, oh, Dantes. Dantes. When will your ordeal... Maybe, Claude, you'd be so kind as to open the door to the parapet. Be done. There's no need to be nasty. Mary and Joseph, wheel the barrow over to the buttons and tip it on my say-so. Well, where are you going to be? I'm carrying you down. You're not expecting me to tip him without you? My oh, back's gone. Then he can stay out here all night and you can explain that to the governor. Oh, just tip it when I say so. And now... One. At last... Two. He's... Three. Free. And it's here, in this one desperate moment, that the true beginnings of the Count may be properly perceived. It's here in the depths of the unrepentant sea, pinch black and frozen, while Edmond Dantes, forgotten prisoner 34, struggles to discover the knife he has for so long concealed. A knife, he prays, will soar through the thoroughly secured bonds which hold him fast to the very bottom of the sea. Dantes, now tempted by the seduction of the deep, to relinquish, to surrender, to forget. Dantes, who knows that in actual fact he can never surrender. Dantes, who knows in every aching fiber of his being that he must in actual fact now fulfill the destiny he has appointed for himself and at last be reborn.
Dantes. Are they for real? Our time together is short. Am I dead? On the contrary, dear Dantes, it is I who has passed. But you can't be here, my dear old friend. You can't be here. Always remember, Edmund. Never forget. Never forget what? The names of those that wronged you. The names of those who connived to ensure your disgrace and destruction. Never forget them. Never. No. No. Then say them. Say them. I'm loud for all the universe to hear. I can't. I can't. I'm so tired. Yeah, I'm say so... them, Edmund. Uh, Dongla. Yes, Dongla. And? Fennel. And? Fennel, Fennel. The, the, yeah, the good, don't is good. Uh, Remember. Uh, Who else? Uh, uh, the prosecutor, the, the crown prosecutor. His name, don't just say his name. The bill for. Repeat them. Repeat the names of those who betrayed you. Dongla, Fennel, de Villefort. Louder. Dongla, Fennel, de Villefort. Louder still, Dantes. Loud enough to wake the righteous. Dongla, Fennel, de Villefort. Good, Dantes. But what of you, my, my dear Abby? Couldn't I be there 34, you hear me? At about this time, I'd imagine... The prison guards are opening the door to your cell. I'm talking to you, Dantes. And we'll attempt to rouse you. Stop playing silly buggers, 34, and get... Oh, no. Oh, bloody hell, no. Close! Close, so affects the governor! What's happened, Swan? Dantes. Dantes has escaped. What do you mean, escaped? Look! That's the Abbey. Oh, no. Then where's Dante's? Exactly. It is all exactly as we predicted, Dante's. But now you must concentrate. Now you must remember why God has given you this great opportunity. Don't la Fernand de Villefort. Yes. Don't la Fernand. De Villefort, and I shall be avenged. Yes. But how? With God's blessing, Dantes. With the powers of deduction, I taught you. And with the treasure. The treasure I bequeathed you. The treasure of Monte Cristo. Oh. Trust that you do God's will, dear Edmund. Trust that you are his chosen instrument of revenge and revelation. I do trust it. I do. And that from this moment on, no earthly king can ever command or contain you again. Riga. And then, as if sent by the very hand of God, the bloated body of a drowned Maltese seaman thumps insolently onto the rocks beside him. Dantes, swift as wild lightning, casts off his filthy prison shirt and hastily pulls on the drowned man's cap and blue jerkin. Over here! Over here! Where are you? On the rocks here! On the, on the rocks! God, did you see? I, I can't! I, I can't reach it! I can't reach it! Run! It's not good! You have to let go of the rock! Don't be drowned! I'll haul you in if you can grab it! Now try! Help me! Help me! Swim! Toward the rock! I have it! I have it! Then hold fast! Good night! Yes! Got you, Maltese! Maltese? Think, Dantes. Think. You are Maltese, aren't you? The wreck yonder! Thought you had to have been. I, I, I am. I, I am. Maltese. Yeah, my, my ship was wrecked. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
is he, Jacopo? Poor man's half drained, Captain, but I think he's Maltese. Uh, throw him overboard. Check that none of these kegs is damaged. Captain Patan, I... Don't watch. You're not thinking straight, Jacopo. He's a spy or squeals to the Coast Guard. Then I'll cut his throat myself. Let's just give him a chance. That's all I ask. Boy, <sighs> safe. Let's get out of the storm. Have some rum, Maltese. <coughs> That's it, my friend. That's it. Gently. Oh, gently. Thank you. Thank you. Don't want you dying on us, do we? No. What's your name? The name's Jacopo. Now, listen to me. Because I don't want to have to say this twice, all right? All right. You don't know us. You don't remember us, clear? Smugglers. You're, uh, you're smugglers. And best you forget it. Now, rest up as well as you're able, and we'll see where we are in the morning. Assuming we're all here, that is. Oh, but wait, friend. The year. What's the year? What? The year. Uh, 1829. And the date? Uh, February the 28th. 14 years. 14 years. You've got to rest, Mortis. <laughs> rest. <laughs> but sleep will not come for Dante's. 14 years. Fourteen years. By dawn, the storm has passed, leaving the sea restless and rebellious. You'll never get her between the rocks, Captain! Think too wild! Let me try! We're way too close! Think I don't know that! Stir her out! Pull her! I am pulling, but she won't! Can I give her a try? You need to get below, Moti! I know these waters! From where? I sailed them a hundred times and worse than this, too! Give your mate the wheel! Now, the trick is to sail her into the squall and then. <clears throat> Surprise her! He's running away from the boat! Yeah. Do you see that, Captain <laughs> Good work, Maltese! Oh, where are we headed? So to Corsica. <sighs> you want me to take over? Oh, she's a good boat, this. She handles well. Of course she does. She's a sure Emily. Hold her steady now. Understood? <laughs> nicely done, Maltese. <laughs> Very nicely done. <laughs> Confident, suddenly youthful Edmond Dantes stands again at the prow of a ship. There she goes! And as the days become weeks, Dantes makes himself indispensable. Who taught you to sell this good Maltese? Picked it up. Picked it up? From Master Simon. Ask no questions, Jacopo. But Tom won't hear a word against you. That's rare, Maltese. Rare like... Unicorns is rare. You're a good man, Jacopo. And I owe you my life. You did every man aboard a fever. That doesn't mean I'm not grateful, though. Nor will I forget it. Never. <laughs> You're a strange one, Maltese. But as Dantes confidently commands the wheel, there now rises before him a younger and more innocent incarnation of himself, standing at the prow of another great ship he came to think of as his own. The fair on. Observe her now, most honoured friends, as she glides gracefully into the old port of Marseille. Ahoy there, Dante! Monsieur Morel! On that most fateful and accursed of days. <laughs> we thought we lost you! <laughs> Not a chance, monsieur! Thanks, sir, boy! Uh, hold on! I'm coming aboard! I'll have a rope lowered! February the 24th in the year 1815. Dead, Dantes? Captain Leclerc is dead? Fourteen long years before. The crew mourn him to a man. And you brought the Farron home in his stead? As was my duty as first mate. Did I do wrong? Wrong? <laughs> wrong? You may well have saved the business. You may well have saved Morel and Sons, boy. Oh, your father will be so proud of you. Hey, Dongla. Chivarelle? Is the cargo safe? Safe and sound and all accounted for. I have the complete inventory and if you like. That's all to... down to you, Edmund. Sorry? It was nothing. <laughs> nothing, he says. Well, Dongla, 
I wouldn't want to guess at the true contents of your sorry soul, but you and the rest of the crew must be down on your knees thanking the good Lord no, for sending no. us Dante's here as Captain Leclerc's first mate. Uh, I can't speak for the rest of the crew, but... My poor knees are quite worn to splinters from all that giving thanks. <laughs> <laughs> worn to splinters. Did he hear that, Dante? Tie them ropes off. Aye, aye. Wait, Francois, I'm coming. If you'll excuse me, Monsieur Morel of Dongla. Dante's. Francois, give me the rope. What a find that young man is. I shall make him captain, I think. Of the Pharaoh. Seafaring talent like that can't go to waste. Well, indeed not, Monsieur Morel. Indeed not. Still, there is the matter of, um... Of what? Of our stop at Elba. Our unexpected stop. Most irregular. What on earth were you doing on Elba? Who can say? Well, I'm sure it was nothing. But well, for God's sake, man. Well, I did happen to glance in on poor Captain Leclerc as he lay dying and saw... Yeah, I'm sure it was nothing. You saw what? The captain give Dantes a package. Addressed to? My oh, fortune teller, Monsieur Morel. All I know is that it delayed our arrival at Marseille by a good two uh, days. Isn't there something you should be doing, Dongla? I'm all done, I believe. Then lend a hand over there, will you? Don't upset you, I hope, sir. You did ask. Yeah, not at all. It's just, just... I'm on my way. Dante! Monsieur! What's this I hear about you stopping off at Elba? Was there some kind of emergency? No, there was no emergency. Captain Leclerc gave me a package for the Grand Marshal. The Grand? And did you deliver it? As instructed. It was an order. It was Captain Leclerc's last. I see. Listen, Edmund, while you were on Elba, you didn't happen to see... He came to speak with the Marshal while I was there, asked about the ship, its cargo... And when I mentioned your name, he recalled that he served with a Morel in Venice. You spoke with him? <laughs> For half a minute. And the Emperor remembered my Uncle Polygar. If that was his... Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> All the same, Dante. Monsieur? One shouldn't be talking openly of conversations with Napoleon Bonaparte. Especially in public. No? Edmund, my boy, listen... It doesn't matter how fine a sailor you are, you can't afford to be naive. Not with the Emperor exiled and the King restored. This is France. Politics. Politics. Everything is politics. Do you know what was contained in the package you handed to the Marshal? No idea. I swear. Yeah. And long may it stay there. Customs are coming aboard with your permission. You're a good boy, Edmund. A good, good boy. And you are the best of men. Indeed, I consider myself to have two fathers. <laughs> my own and your own good self, monsieur. Uh, you will send my very best to your father, won't you? Uh, I will, sir. As soon as I'm done here, I intend to go straight home. Oh, you'd better look lively there, Dantes. After all, I understand there's also a certain young Catalan who'll be very glad to know you're home safe. <laughs> Mercedes. The most eh? beautiful girl in all Marseille, they <laughs> in, say. In all the world, monsieur. <laughs> Talk like that would charm a mermaid boy. Well, monsieur Morel. Oh, haven't you got anything better to do than pester me, Dongla? Did young Dantes give good reason for our stop at Elba? He did, Dongla. He did, yes. Now, I'd like to see the inventory. It's a shame to see him neglecting his duty. He neglected nothing. And he told you about the other letter? What other letter? The letter he was given along with the package by Captain Leclerc. I was sure he would have mentioned it. If that letter exists, then I'll ask for it and Edmund will give it straight to me. Oh, best not, monsieur. Let sleeping dogs lie, eh? Then why bring up the bloody thing, man? No, idle curiosity. Nothing more. I'd hate to see Dantes get into any kind of trouble. Times being what they are. I'll fetch you up that inventory. Altiz! Altiz! But Dantes' reverie is not to last. Daydreaming again, Maltese? Captain Patan. Something the matter with you, man? Not a thing. Set a course for the Isle of Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo? Someone step on your grave? Huh? I don't know the place, do you? I'll set a course straight away. And set a course for her he does, while his soul trembles with excitement and apprehension. Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo. Monte... Oh, 
What the hell's happened? Coast Guard Patrol, Captain Patan. Port side. Can we outrun them? <laughs> no chance. Bastards will kill us! Maltese. Yes, Captain. Get yourself a gun. A gun? You know how to handle a gun, don't you? I do. And stand your ground. You may depend upon it. Ten minutes later, and the deck of the Jeune Amélie is soaked. Help me, we'll see some! Help me! In blood. They're not saving you, pirate! Lower your weapon. You're talking to me? Lower your weapon, or I shoot. We are the king's Corsica! I answer to no earthly king. You what? Ah! You killed him, Ortiz. You bloody killed him. Are you all right? I, th I think so. Then let's get this done! <laughs> As dawn breaks across the sea, there is no sign of the Coast Guard or their scuttled boat. There is just the blue, blue water lapping in the still of the morning. Did what we had to do, lads. Coast Guard wasn't looking to bring any of us in for trial. You know it. I know it. Now I say we head to Monte Cristo. Leave last night to the sea. You with me? Aye. 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 What are we waiting for? Monte Cristo! <laughs> Maltese, when you're ready! With the gentlest of touches, the Jeune Amélie at last sails out across that lively sea where even the waves seem to sing Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo! Bring her in! Maltese! Words cannot do justice to Dante's first glimpse of the barren Isle of Monte Cristo, with its outcrops of skull white rock baking in the two o'clock sun. Drop anchor! With its flocks of wild goats scampering curiously this way and that as they take a first glimpse of the crew of the Jeune Amélie now setting up camp on that long, undisturbed beach. Maltese! Yes, Captain? You and Jacopo take a scout around the island while we set up camp down here. I'd sooner go on my own. Why? I'll be faster on my own. What are you standing there for? Dante's heart is fit to burst with anticipation. And Maltese! Yes, Captain? Bring us back some dinner! <laughs> For over an hour, Dantes climbs and clambers across the rocks of Monte Cristo, the words of Abbe Faria repeating in his ears. Well, tried river bed ends and the ravine begins. Those are the caves where you are first to look. Remorselessly, the sun beats down upon poor Dantes, but no amount of heat will slow him in his quest. And after an hour following the river... The ravine. This must be the ravine. Maltese! Where are you, Maltese? Jacopo! Captain says he wants everybody back in the boat! On my way! Did you kill a goat for roasting? It's by the overhang over there. Oh. What do you think, then? Monte Cristo. I can see why nobody much bothers with it. Let's get back, shall we? Maltese. What? When the Coast Guard came aboard, uh -huh. he said you answered to no earthly king. It was his life or yours. Hey, and don't think I'm not grateful, but I still don't understand what... If that's so, then I hope you'll do something for me, Jacopo. Name it. Never question me like that again. Agreed? If you say so, Maltese. Well, the goat's in that cave, yonder. <laughs> You're not going to try and jump that gap, are you? <laughs> watch me. But well, why if you fall between well, the I rocks? I know what I'm doing. Hey, you watch yourself. Always. Oh, oh, oh. Maltese! Oh. Maltese! Captain Patel! Captain Patel, we need help! Here. Not 
not suggesting I leave you here, Malty. I'm suggesting you finish your trade with the Turk and then send someone back to find me, Captain. Try and move, just a little. <laughs> it's no good. My back, my back. I'll stay with him. That might be best. You need Jacobo on board with you, Captain. You know... <laughs> you, you know you do. We'll leave you food, <laughs> drink, and such provisions as you'll need. But mark my words, we'll be back for you, Maltese. Come, Jacopo! Hey, you look after yourself, my friend. You too. You too. I don't want to lose the wind, Jacopo! I'll make sure Patan's true to his word. Go! That you can die on us! Go! But no sooner has the jeune Emily set sail than... <sighs> To work, Dantes. To work. Where well, tried river bed ends and the ravine begins. Those are the caves where you are first to look. You ask me, my most honored friends, to describe the exact location of where Dantes at last discovers. <coughs> Cave, Abbey Farina. Is this the cave where you hid your treasure, my dear old friend? But now, As his eyes adjust to the dark of the cave, God be praised. he sees, dazzling, even in that pale half-light, a cavern crammed tight with emeralds and diamonds and pearls without compare. It's not... it's not possible. Where he discovers such riches as are not found in heaven. And at this moment... In a forgotten cave on the all but forgotten isle of Monte Cristo. Dead, you say? I'm sorry to say so. His true journey begins. Dantes is dead. He is. To Dantes. Dear departed Dantes. To Dantes. Won't you at least let me pour your glass of wine in his memory, Abbe Bassani? I am quite content with water. The sign of the inn of the Pont du Gard creaks in even the slightest breeze. Did you uh, know poor Dante's well? I administered the last rites to him. Oh, then he, he died with a clear conscience. His death, I do assure you, Monsieur Cadrus, was utterly wretched. But very few customers on that fly-bitten and dusty road outside Marseille ever stopped to hear it. May I ask what it was killed him? Prison killed him. That he survived as long as he did was a miracle in itself. Oh, did you just catch... Habits one picks up. Now, fly away. <sighs> Perhaps you might say a prayer for Dantes. Let us look a little closer at the kindly, somewhat grizzled face of Abbe Busoni. You see how the Lord only punishes the good. I believe the Lord only punishes the wicked. And perhaps we may find features with which we are already acquainted. Well, there I would have to disagree with you. I take Dantes. Was Edmund Dantes good? I believed him to be a criminal. Oh, there's a lot I could tell you about that young man. Things that happened. There are. But honour demands silence. Oh, excuse me. You knew his father, I believe. Oh, old Louis Dantes. My poor heart breaks to even hear his name. How that man suffered. Petitioning the magistrates every day for some news of his son, receiving nothing. Awful, awful. He died of typhoid, I believe. Typhoid? He died of starvation. Starvation? Sure you weren't acquainted with old Dantes, father? You say the old man petitioned every day. Stood on the steps outside the Crown Prosecutor's office. But Monsieur de Villefort would not receive him. De Villefort. In fact... The name is Angus. De Villefort denied even interviewing Dantes on the night of his arrest. 
Can't have been anybody else, though, can it? He was the man in charge. And is this Monsieur de Villefort still in Marseille? Oh, went straight to the top, did de Villefort. No flies on him. Made Crown Prosecutor of Paris. Crown Prosecutor? Yeah, make no mistake. This is a very powerful man we're talking about. Made his name hunted down Bonapartists. Revolutionaries. Petrus! Yes, my butterfly. How many times have I said about drinking with our customers? But we don't have customers, do we? We never have customers. Now, come down and talk with us, why don't you? Who's this, then? Allow me to present my wife, Matilde. Enchanted. Madam, I am the Abbey Bussoni, and I am an acquaintance of an old friend of your husband's. He's drunk with that boo, then. <laughs> now, now. His name was Edmund Dantes. Dantes? That's the boy that disappeared. The one you shh, said... Shh, 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 shh. Come and sit down. You knew him. Speak your business, Mr. Priest. Wine, my butterfly, wine. Shut up. Well... It was always Dante's avowed belief that he was wrongly accused and imprisoned. He spoke of it many times, and I must confess that I came to believe him. I'd like you to leave, Abbe. Uh, of course. When have that talk in my in? Allegations! I won't have it. I wasn't implying that you had any hand in it. No, there, there, there are issues surrounding the case. Issues, Abbe Bassoni, delicate issues. Of course, I quite understand there are sensitivities. I assume, then, that you won't be interested in what Dantes has bequeathed to you. Bequeathed to A us? A pleasure talking to you, well, uh, Monsieur Cadrus, uh, madam. What, 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 what did Dantes leave us? I thought you wanted me well, to... Well, can't have been much, can it? Can't it? Glances... Curious, avaricious glances are exchanged between husband and wife. Glances the Abbe does not fail to note. For a few years, Dante's cared for a fellow prisoner who was incarcerated in the same cell as him, Lord Wilmore, an Englishman released after the collapse of the Republic and the restoration of King Louis. God save him! Quite. In gratitude, Wilmore left young Dante's... This... What is that? Is that, uh... Is this, this some sort of joke? I assure you it is not. Then what is it? It is what it looks like. Well, it looks like a diamond ring. The stone alone is worth 75,000 francs, I believe. And it was Dante's last wish that I sell it and divide its value five ways. A fifth to your good self, Monsieur <gasps> Carouse. <gasps> A fifth to Dongla, who served with him upon the Ferrand. Another to Fernand, the Catalan fisherman. Another to his beloved fiancée, Mercedes. And a last fifth to his dear departed... Excuse me. To his dear departed father, Louis Dantes. But since I now learn that old Dantes is dead, then its value will have to be divided into four and shared amongst his remaining trusted friends. What do you say, monsieur? But at the inn of the Pont du Gard... There is only an astonished silence and the creak of a long neglected sign. I say there are things that you should know about these so called friends of poor Edmund Dantes. Things? Bolt the door, wife. The inn of the Pont de Gare is closed for the rest of the day. You mind if I uh, take a closer look at that ring? With pleasure. Oh. And you wouldn't be lying to us, Father. <laughs> Abbe Bassoni's a man of God, my butterfly. And I won't have him insulted with insinuations. Not while he rests beneath my roof. Now bolt the door. But I must tell you, in all seriousness, Abbe Bassoni, that the men of whom I'm about to speak are powerful, powerful people now. These friends of Dante. Very powerful. Do you understand? I'm not sure that they I... They could crush us easy as you could have crushed that fly. I see. So, where to begin? Where to begin? Light gleams now in the eyes of the innkeeper Cadrus. I suggest the beginning. A light as bright as diamonds glittering deliciously in a flame. Night before Dantes was arrested, we was all in this bar, just off the quayside, the marionette. There was me, Dongla, and the Catalan fisherman, Fanon. Go on. Of course, we're going back 15 years here, but I recall that night clear as if it was yesterday. Dongla had just returned from three months at sea with Dantes, and he had a right thirst on him. But the way I remember it, it was Fanon who said, Captain, 
Old Morel made Edmund Bloody Dantes captain of the Pharaon. Tell the worm, why don't you? But that's not right, Donglar. That's out of order, that is. You deserve captain, and I don't care who knows it. Dantes is a good man. He'll do well. To Dantes. To Dantes. Dantes. Always bloody Dantes. Did you see him in Mercedes on the quayside? Bloody Romeo and Juliet. He's only been away three months. Me, I've been at her side day after day, waiting for something, anything, some sign of affection. I even sing to her. So does a sweet little pussycat. You want to take this outside? Hey. Will you stop making a spectacle of yourself, then, on? But I love her. I love her. And I'd sooner be captain of the Pharaoh. But we can't have everything in this life. Pass a bit more at wine, will you? It's only because you have never loved that you can be so callous. The only thing you want to do is get inside them pretty petticoats. I've seen the way you look at her. Naughty, naughty for now. Another word and I'll cut your drunken throat, Cadrus, I will. Still, I do feel bad about one thing. And what's that? Protecting a traitor. Not doing my duty to the king. What are you talking about? Dantes has a letter. Don't know who it's addressed to exactly, but two days shy of getting back to Marseille, he decides to drop anchor at Elba. See the Emperor. You saying Dantes is plotting to bring Bonaparte back? I'm saying that I don't feel right about knowing what I do. As a loyal and true subject of His Majesty. That's why I wrote this. For the attention of the Crown Prosecutor, Monsieur de Villefort. Quietly, man. Jesus. Don't look like you're right. Because I disguised it, stupid. Just read. For the attention of the Crown Prosecutor, Monsieur de Villefort, regarding Edmund Dantes, first mate of the Pharaon, arriving today, 24th of February, 1815, at Marseille, Dantes holds a letter addressed to a member or members of the traitorous Bonapartist committee in Paris. Incontrovertible proof of his guilt will be made when the letter is found upon his person. Dantes may be discovered at his father's house or aboard the Pharaoh. Oh, my, Donglar. Well, you can't send that. It would destroy him. Why not? For no. Maybe it does go a bit far, Donglar. Ah, you're right. You're both right. <laughs> I'm sorry I wrote it. Pass us that candle and I'll burn the note right now. Wait, wait. What? Just scrunch it up. Like this? Exactly like that. Now chuck it away. Done. You don't want to leave that thing lying about in here. Anyone could pick it up. Is that a fact? Have another drink, Kudrus. Oh, me. What about the note? What about what? The no! Oh, it's nothing for you to worry about, Cadros. In fact, as I recall, you never saw any no, did you? And with that, Dungla and Fanon walked out of the bar, but... But? Night has wrapped its cloak about the scuffed old table, and only a solitary candle. But it was all a ruse. Gutters. Because no sooner had Fanon and Donglar made it look as if they'd left the bar, then back comes Fanon to retrieve the note and deliver it straight to the authorities. To De Villefort. You saw this. I was out in the alley, wasn't I? Taking myself a moment, if you know what I mean, dear Abbey. And you heard? Everything. Did you get the letter back, Fanon? I did, Donglar. I did. Oh. What do we do about Cadruce? Kedrus is a thief and a drunk. There's nobody going to take his word over ours. Perhaps he should have himself an accident. And draw attention to ourselves. Think, Fernand, think. All right, all right. No need to say it like... You're clear, Fernand. Clear about what will happen as soon as this letter is delivered. 
The consequences. Dantes will be arrested, Donglar. Dantes will be arrested and more than likely thrown in jail for treason. Then that will be an end to him. And you can live with that. If it means you get to be captain of the Pharaoh and I marry Mercedes, then... And nobody must ever know. Won't be me that opens his mouth. Then deliver the letter to the prosecutor's office. Why can't you go? Because I might be recognised, dummy. Who are you calling a dummy? Will you please just get a grip on that temper of yours? Now go. And did he go? Of course he did. Young Dantes was arrested at his wedding feast with Mercedes. Guards just marched right in, took him off to who knows where. But there's been a mistake. That's what they all say, Dantes. But I don't know what I'm supposed to have done. Oh, oh, oh. Save it for the Crown Prosecutor. Now get on your feet, Mercedes! Mercedes! And that was the last I heard of him until you showed up here this evening. And Fernand and Dongla, what became of them? Fernand joins the army, doesn't he? Rises high, decorated. Bags himself the title of the Commander de Morcerf. Very nice, thank you. Commander de Morcerf. And Dongla is now an investment banker. And it's Baron Dongla, thank you very much. One of the richest men in Paris, they say. Very powerful. They both are. That's why we must be cautious, discreet. Then Edmund Dantes was betrayed both by Commander de Morcerf and Baron Dongla. On Jesus' blood, all I say here tonight is true. Then you were right, Abby Faria. Right about everything. What? My husband is a lot of things, but a liar he is not. Thank you both for your candor. If you would bring me my hat, Monsieur Cadrus, uh, of course. Uh, uh, aren't you forgetting something, um, Abbe Sonny? <laughs> uh, forgive me, my dear lady. Uh, there is just one more question I have. And that is? Mercedes, Dante's fiance. Did she not wait for him? Well, she waited for years, didn't she? The poor girl's heart was quite broken. Yeah. For two years, she resisted Fernand's advances, petitioned the court until... Until? She accepted, finally, that her Edmund was never coming back and was most likely dead. That's when she married Fernand. After everything he did to Dante's? Yeah, don't suppose she had any idea, did she? They've even got a boy, I think. Uh... Oh, well, Albert. Albert. Mm. Quite the little prince, I hear. <laughs> I see. Well, then, what can I say? Monsieur Cadrus, madame. Oh, oh. <laughs> May Dante's diamond bring you all the happiness you deserve. Oh. <laughs> and Baron Dongla, Commander Fernand. Are not worth further discussion. Oh. <laughs> Bless you, Abby Bassani. Bless you. Oh. An hour later, and Monsieur and Madame Cadrus consider their good fortune. We should go get it valued. I'll be sure to do that tomorrow. I'll come with you. It's a while since I got to Marseille. Believe it best if you stay here, wife. Hey, pardon? Said it would be better if you stayed here. What was that supposed to mean? Husband! Time to fly away, my little butterfly. Get away from me! Cadrus! Get away from me! While at the side of the road, in the depths of that dry and savage night, a man sits, weeping. For all that he has so grievously lost. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, um, I'm not sure I quite caught the name. Lord Wilmore. We've heard this name before. And our business is? Edmund Dantes, imprisoned in the Chateau d'If. And we have met this man before. Disguised first as a corpse, and later as a priest. I'm looking for information. You've dropped some coins, your lordship. 600 francs, if I'm not mistaken. Would you say it was enough to gain a glance at an old prison record? 600? The Dante's file would be kept here in the public records office, uh, Edmund Dante's. It would, it would. Then... Edmund 
Dantes. <laughs> Edmund Dantes. Ah, here it is. Uh, the, the case file. Right at the very bottom. It appears somebody may have attempted to bury it. It would seem so. Although you do know that this prisoner tried to escape from the Chateau d'If. I didn't know that. About a year or so ago, quite the scandal it was. Disguised himself as the corpse of an old priest. Oh, heavens. Fazir or Faria or some such. The two of them were in cahoots, apparently. They'd even dug some sort of a tunnel between their cells. Desperate measures, eh? Then this Dante's is at large. No, no, sir. Not a chance. Nobody escapes the deef. Dante's was thrown into the sea. Cannonball about his feet. He's dead. Drowned, without a doubt. Would you mind if I took a look at it, uh, the file? Be my guest, your lordship. And are these notes on the arrest papers from um, De Villefort? Uh, that, that, that's the Crown Prosecutor's signature, yes. The notes would have been taken on the night of Dantes's arrest. I see. Is there anything else I can do for you, Lord Wilmore? You've been more than helpful, Monsieur Beville. Thank you. There they are. A little faded, but quite distinguishable. The words Dantes has dreaded for so very long. Regarding Edmund Dantes, fanatical Bonaparte, his plot to return Bonaparte from Elba, solitary confinement in the Chateau d'If, close supervision, N-A-T-B-T. Uh, well, what do these letters signify? May I see? No action to be taken. It means the prisoner, Dantes, was considered to be too dangerous to be released. Ever? It would seem so. And the handwriting is... That of de Villefort, the Crown Prosecutor. It's definitely his hand. I've seen that signature a thousand times. And these letters here? Uh, um, are petitions from one Mercedes Roas, Louis Dantes, the prisoner's father, and Monsieur Morel, the prisoner's employer. Ran the trading firm Morel and Sons down at the old port. Ran? I hear the old man Morel's fallen on hard times. Apparently the company's on the very brink of collapse. Such a fine family, too. A shame, really. Where were we? Let's call our agreed sum a thousand. Your lordship, I don't know what to say. I can, of course, trust upon your discretion. Of course, of course, absolutely. Lost? But Ferron is lost. Yeah, but the crew survived. I had confirmation from Penelon, the first mate. But the loss of the Ferron must have dire implications for your business, Monsieur Morel. Dire implications. It means we are ruined, sir. Lord Wilmore, face shadowed, eyes narrowed, stares intently at the worried man before him. A man worry has made stoop. Nervous. And now you are come to me today with, I'm sure, a final demand for all that we owe your company in Rome, Lord Wilmore. Actually, the contrary. Beg pardon? I'm authorised by Messrs. Thompson and French of Rome to extend your credit. It is all here. Extended? I assume that this will help you manage your business for at least three more months. But your lordship, without a boat... As a resourceful man of business, you have my every confidence. But this is more than we could possibly have hoped for. Yes. Allow me to shake your hand once more, Lord Wilmot. Monsieur Morel, I assure you that this decision is based solely on your solid business performance over the last 40 years. Let us not be sentimental. Oh, indeed not. Then please accept this note of security. I... I don't know what to say. Well, when one discovers oneself to be at a loss for words, it is always good advice, I find, to say nothing. <laughs> we shall meet again on the morning of September the 5th, at which time we shall reassess your financial situation. Is that acceptable? Oh, more than acceptable. Until the 5th. Until then. And now... As old man Morel gathers his wife and daughter to share in his unexpectedly good news, 
Lord Wilmore walks purposefully towards his handcrafted yacht, exhaustively fitted with every conceivable oh. comfort. Welcome aboard, sir. Thank you, Jacopo. But no sooner is Lord Wilmore aboard and away from the prying eyes of the always curious Marseille. Successful meeting, Maltese? Most satisfactory. Then he removes his ostrich feathered hat and ornately laced collar and gently tugs off his soft leather boots, unmistakably revealing... Jacopo. Edmond Dantes. I need you to listen carefully to me. Yes, sir. There is a man I would like you to find right away. His name is Penelon. Tell him that if he loves the Morales, as I know he does, then he's to do all that is asked of him without question. Straight away. And Jacopo. Yes, sir. Discretion. <laughs> Always, Maltese. But three months pass as swift as wasps. Leave me be, Maximilian, please. About spilt honey. I insist that you open this door. Did I not make myself clear? Perfectly. <clears throat> what are you doing? Father? Not another step, Maximilian, and, and, and please don't interfere. The gun is loaded. As is mine. What? I've come to join you, Father. Join me? Let us both die here today. As father and son, in these once proud offices of Morel and Sons. Family honour requires only my blood. Our bankruptcy besmirches us all. I insist I die with you. But who will look after your mother and sister if we both take our lives today? My mind is quite made up. Uh, and who will tell Lord Wilmore our business is collapsed, if not you, Maximilian? Is he coming today? September the 5th. But honour demands... Family honour demands my death, not yours, Max. Thank you, Mother, for, for all that we have been blessed with over the years. Attend to your sister, Julie, too. She is your responsibility now. Father! Father! The door, Maximilian. I don't want your sister distressed. Oh, of course. Oh, this may not be the best time for, for any... what? You must listen to your brother, Julie. A gun, Father? These are not matters that concern you. Not matters that... Max? Honour demands. Honour demands that you look at this. Is that... A diamond? It is. From where? I don't know, but I've received a letter from some person who signed himself as Sinbad. Sinbad? And, according to the letter, it is Sinbad's greatest sorrow to see the once great name of Morel brought low. So for that reason, he wanted me to accept this diamond on your behalf. It is out of the question. Completely out of the question. Who is this Sinbad? From the tone of his letter, I sensed that he was very familiar with our family. But the diamond is not the reason I'm here, Father. It isn't? The Theron is saved. What? It's coming into port right now. Morel and Sons is saved from ruin, Father. See for yourself. What can this really be? The eyeglass. Uh, fetch me the eyeglass. Here you are. That's Penelon. That's Penelon on the deck. And, and he's waving. Morel and Sons is saved, Max. <laughs> Hey! Oh, oh, oh my, my hat! Where's my hat? We, we must get down there immediately. I'll put the guns away, man. Oh, yes, yes, Father. The Lord be praised! But we cannot linger here, my most honoured friends. We cannot watch as the Faron is unloaded and the fortunes of a family are reversed. Nor can we afford to idle away a minute or two studying the familiar features of the gentleman in the canary yellow cloak who observes this scene from the shadows of a vintner's doorway and who brushes away a solitary tear as he gives the signal... Set a course for Greece, Jacopo. Straight away, Maltese. ...to set sail. Good night, be there, lads! We sail within the half hour! He must have told you something about himself. Anything? All I know is that I owe him my life. Of course you recognise our location, my most honoured guests. Honestly, Maximilian, he's like some kind of benevolent octopus with an invisible network of tentacles spreading every which way at once. An octopus? And you arranged to rendezvous with him today? Ten o'clock at my apartments on the 21st of May. Yes, we are in Paris, in the fashionably decorated drawing room of one of its most eligible bachelors. <laughs> Do try to look just the tiniest bit interested, Max. Albert de Morcerf. I am. And did we not last see his guest 
Maximilian Morel, on a quayside in Marseille some ten long years before. He is, without doubt, the most extraordinary fellow. For now it is time to speak of the cataclysm. Excuse me, sir. The cataclysm in Paris. Yes, my sir? There is a gentleman at the door, sir. He says he has an appointment with you. Did he give a name? He did, sir. The Count of Monte Cristo. Of course, Dongla is consumed with envy, but he'd never go so far as to actually admit it. And this Count of Monte Cristo has called upon your husband. Paris is cold for me. Apparently, he requested a line of credit at the bank worth over six million francs. Six million? According to Dongla, he is as rich as Croesus, and the apartment he has bought himself. Oh, the pride of the Champs Elysees. Goodness. Not that anyone's actually seen it, of course. But Paris is also alive with rumour. He received no visitors. Eight weeks in town and not one invitation, despite his being invited to every fashionable salon there is. No. Outrageous, isn't it? Speaking of outrageous, I take it you've seen the front page of this morning's newspaper. I have. And I, for one, do not believe a word of it. Commander Fernando Morcerf, a national traitor? Nonsense. <laughs> Your husband should be ashamed for printing it. My words, exactly. But will Dongla listen? As far as I'm concerned, the mere fact that the de Morcerfs are proceeding as planned with this year's spring ball proves, categorically proves, that the commander has nothing, absolutely nothing, to answer for. Do you suppose the Count is invited? One would imagine so. Monsieur de Villefort will prosecute the case if it ever comes to that, I assume. Oh, please. Don't even speak of it, dear Hermine. <sighs> People have been coming and going all morning. To be honest, it's a blessing to be out of the house. Oh, how very inconvenient it must be for all of you. Edouard, I do not worry about. He's such a wonderful, wonderful child. <laughs> Indeed. But Valentine... <sighs> To be perfectly honest with you, I am at something of a loss as to what to do with that silly girl this afternoon. She's so... she's so very... Valentine. Um, take the dappled greys out for a ride. Oh, no. Uh, why not? The carriage waits in the courtyard. Oh. But let us now attend, most honoured friends, to the clatter of hooves and wheels on the cobbled streets as they thunder towards those same apartments, the apartments of the Count of Monte Cristo. And watch as... <laughs> terrifying, eh? What's happening to your mother? Hold on to your brother and all our vanity! They suddenly found her. I just can't imagine how it can have happened, Count. No. And let us now witness the first act of the cataclysm the Count has come to wreak on those who so maliciously betrayed him. One minute we're in the carriage, and the next, the next, the horses are... are whatever happened, do you think? I have no idea. The rearing. Oh. Oh, drink a little more of this, Madame de Villefort. <sighs> I can't think what we would have done if your man had not been there to assist us. I cannot. No. What is this? A tonic to revive you. Nothing more. And Edouard? Where's Edouard? He and Valentine are next door. Are they all right? I believe Valentine is reading and Edouard is playing contentedly with his toys. If anything were to happen to that most dearest of boys, then I don't know. I really don't know mm. what I would do. And Valentine? <sighs> Valentine is more, how does one say it politely, self-contained. Hmm. Takes after her late mother, my husband's first wife. Then she is not your daughter. Oh, heavens no. <laughs> this Alexia is really very good. Was it made from some sort of compound? It was. Of what elements? Is chemistry an interest? To a frivolous, silly woman such as myself, but yes, Count, yes. The light that science casts on the invisible world has always fascinated. In that case, I would be delighted to enlighten you. 
And as the wife discovers the secrets of the Count's elixir, so the husband... Order! Order! This emergency tribunal will come to order. Monsieur de Vifort. ...makes his case. The allegations prepared by the Crown Prosecutor's Office against Commander Fernand de Morcef are as follows. One, that during the war against Turkey ten years ago, he actively conspired with the Turkish authorities against our ally, the potentate Ali Pasha. Two, that he profited personally from this act of treachery. And three, that this betrayal led directly to the assassination of one of France's most trusted allies, as well as ensuring the eventual victory of the enemy. Order! No matter how unpalatable the members of this committee may find these allegations, it is my intention to provide you with an eyewitness tomorrow who will directly corroborate all that the Crown alleges. Good afternoon, gentlemen. What always intrigues me about this particular elixir is how easily it can be appropriated into something infinitely more dangerous. Dangerous? <laughs> In what way? As you have just demonstrated, a simple readjustment of the chemicals is enough to produce a deadly poison. Poison? So subtle, one would have difficulty believing the victim had died for anything but natural causes. Oh, very macabre. But I think that perhaps Madame de Villefort has had enough of her chemistry lesson for one day. It was most diverting, my dear Count. A pleasure. And may I say how magnificent these apartments of yours are? They are nothing to what my house in Otoy will be. Your house in Otoy? A house I hope that you and your husband will do me the great honor of visiting. Number 28 Rue de la Fontaine. I'm sure Monsieur de Villefort will only be too delighted. Although I trust you are not afraid of ghosts. Whatever do you mean? Well, the house comes with a most curious story. But I'm sure you were in much too much of a hurry to hear it. <laughs> I believe you are toying with me, <laughs> monsieur. I? Yes, you. Well, the story goes that there were once two lovers. He, a young widower, she, a beautiful heiress. Not long after their secret affair commenced, she found she was with child. Neither could afford the attendant scandal, and in their desperation, they decided to bury their newborn under a tree. <gasps> where the pathetic remains were, tragically, unearthed many years later. Dear God, who would do such a thing? And it is said that one can still hear the infant's ghostly wails in the night. Of course, it is just a nonsensical story. Of course. <sighs> And I have taken up far too much of your time. Not at all. Now, I, I, I shall gather up the children and, and bid you adieu. Will I be seeing you at the spring ball this evening? Sadly, no. <laughs> My husband does not believe it appropriate. These dreadful allegations against Commander de Mosseur. Oh, yes, the allegations. But naturally, I don't believe a word of it, but my husband is, well, the Crown Prosecutor. Are the children through here? They are. Then I shall see myself out, and thank you again. I've never seen a house like it. Oh. Yes, Grandfather, the Count of Monte Cristo. They say he's even wealthier than you. Wealthier? Possible? Not. <laughs> <laughs> the house of the Crown Prosecutor, Gérard de Villefort, is a tall, somewhat gloomy house on the Champs-Élysées. And tonight he is going to the Spring Ball. All of Paris cannot stop talking about him. The stories one hears, slaves. And in its attic sits an old man whom illness has all but struck silent. No. And his beloved granddaughter, no. Valentine de Villefort. I was to attend, but... Father has forbidden it on account of these charges against Commander de Morcerf. And I was so looking forward to going, because among the invited guests is... 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 Oh, that I might see him for just a moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, Grandfather. Grandfather. He is of good family. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you. I wish I could, but I cannot. 
Father would never allow it. Cry. Don't. Valentine. You look truly beautiful tonight, eh, Day? Now at last, most honored friends, it is time for me to make my first... You shall dazzle them all. ...appearance. My master exaggerates. You're trembling, child. Forgive me, master, but I am afraid. Of what? Of seeing him again. I shall be at your side. No harm will befall you. But if Commander de Morsef recognizes me? Remember, I am always with you. After you. But for the briefest of moments, the Count hesitates. I do not believe I can do this. And in his head... Countess? A voice. How am I ever to endure this night? The voice of his beloved and long-dead friend and fellow prisoner. By remembering that you carry out God's will. Abbe Faria. But if I fail him... You are God's instrument. Here to carry out his divine will and take his just revenge on... on... Fernand de Mosef. Trust in him and you cannot fail. You cannot. You are, as ever, my truest guide. Now go, Dantes. Go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Count of Monte Cristo and Mademoiselle Ede. Excited, curious eyes now peer over exquisitely ornamented fans, and sharp, curious glances bolt wild as white lightning across that ballroom bedecked with flowers. Remember what I taught you, Ede. Never look down. And it is now that I see him. So we meet at long last, monsieur. You must be the Count of Monte Cristo. An honor. Fernand de Morcerf at your service. Commander de Morcerf, permit me to introduce a day. Enchanted. The man who murdered my father. My mother. My brothers. My sisters. The man who now gently takes my hand in his. Yes. The man who now raises it to his... Enchanted. ...lips. May I ask how long you have both been in Paris? A few weeks. Your son, Albert, has been most hospitable. And has my son had the great good fortune to be introduced to the charming Ada? I do not believe he has yet had that pleasure. Perhaps you were on an errand for me that day. Perhaps, master. An errand? Ada is part of your household. She is my slave. Your... Oh. I bought her in a market in Constantinople some ten years ago. She was a child then, barely nine, I believe. The blue of her eyes was what first caught my attention. They are indeed lustrous, Count. And had obviously seen such terrible suffering. And did you learn much about her history? I learnt enough. Which was? That she was the daughter of a cruelly betrayed sultan, and as a consequence of that betrayal had suffered the most terrible misfortunes. We've not met before, have we, Count? I do not believe we have. But I understand you have visited Baron Danglars. In fact, we spoke of you amongst many other things. You spoke of me? Only in the most roundabout of terms, you understand. Well, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance at last. The honor was mine. I hope that you will both enjoy the ball. Indeed. Count, a day. But as the commander walks across the hall, he does not so much as look at another of his fashionable guests. Instead, he opens the side door and disappears into his study. Albert. Yes, Father? I need you to take over my duties tonight. Dear God. Tell me what's happened. It was Monte Cristo. Your friend, Monte Cristo. What was? It was he who has spread this terrible rumor against me. I oh, know it is. You must be mistaken. I am not mistaken, the girl. What girl? The girl he is with. You're not making any sense, Father. Please, Albert. 
If he has dishonoured you, then demand satisfaction. I can't do that, not with this wretched tribunal tomorrow. How the devil do you know this Monte Cristo anyway? He, he saved me from bandits in Rome. And is a bandit himself. Then honour demands that I... Honour be damned. Very well. If you will not do something about this... Albert! Albert! I can't tell you how delighted we were finally to see you at our house, Count. Uh, Baron Donglas is indeed a financial sorcerer. I'm sure my husband was only too happy to assist you. And may I say that that is a most bewitching sable you're wearing. It was a gift. Uh, from your devoted husband, I assume? <laughs> For shame, Count. I thought that was you, Hermine. Mercedes, at last. <laughs> you have outdone yourself as ever, my dear. The decor, quite magnificent. Oh, thank you. And have you met the Count of Monte Cristo? I have heard so very much about you. And for the tiniest moment... Madame? She falters. Oh, forgive me. You are most welcome to our home. As if startled by a half-remembered presence. Thank you. And of course, I wanted to thank you personally for the great service you did my son in Rome. I was only too glad to have been of assistance. For a moment, the briefest of moments, the Count is no longer here, but racing along a quayside in Marseille. Mercedes! Mercedes! With his heart fit to burst with love and longing, as he all but sprints to her rickety house on that long ago day at the end of February, 1815. Your home! Your home! 25 years before. When did you get back? Just an hour ago. Is something wrong? Wrong? What could possibly be wrong? Then you've missed me. <laughs> Come here, Edmond Dantes. <laughs> Oh, I, I spoke to my father, Mercedes. Tonight, we will celebrate our marriage feast at last. The room is booked. It's all arranged. <gasps> and we are finally to be married. In just a few weeks. <laughs> oh, and that's not all. What, Edmund? Well, you'd probably not be interested. <laughs> what? Well, Monsieur Morel wants me as captain of the Ferrari. <gasps> as cap? That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, return to us at last, Dantes. <sighs> Fenon, <laughs> how are you, my friend? Never better. I hope Fenon has been taking good care of you in my absence, Merci. <laughs> he has been most attentive. Then I am indebted to you. You're coming to our marriage feast tonight, I hope. You're... May I speak with you for a moment, Mercedes? <laughs> if Edmund permits. As long as you be sure to give her back to me. <laughs> 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 what did I ever do to be treated so hard? Oh, not again, Fernand, especially not here. But then there is no hope for me, for us. There is, and there never was any us. When he ever... Well, then I cannot, I cannot live. Oh, don't do this, please. Fernand! Congratulations to you, Dantes. To you both. If you will excuse me. Uh, Fernand? Oh, leave him, Edmund. Oh, did I do something to upset him? Oh, let us take him at his word. But let us follow the scheming Fernand. Now you're clear, Fernand. To that alleyway in the old port of Marseille. Clear about what will happen as soon as this letter is delivered? The consequences? To his rendezvous with Danglars. Dantes will be arrested. Dantes will be arrested and more than likely thrown in jail for treason. And that will be an end to him. And you can live with that? If it means I marry Mercedes, then... And nobody must ever know. Won't be me that opens his mouth. To their betrayal and malicious denunciation of the innocent Edmond Dantes. Monte Cristo! Oh, Albert! It is you who has dishonoured our family's good name. Do you deny it? I do. Then please, identify the young lady who accompanies you tonight. Her name is Ede, and she is, I believe, the daughter of the late Sultan Ali Pasha. And you bring her here, to this house? As I was invited to do. My glove, sir. <gasps> Please, don't do this, Albert. Shall we say the banks of the Seine? If that is what you wish. My second will call upon you at first light. 
The day after tomorrow. Will that be convenient? It will. Very well, then. Albert! Paris whirls into a hive of whispers. The ball was suddenly over. Scandal. Imagine. He has no soul, they say. Oh, the Count of Monte Cristo. And he never loses. Never. And as the night turns into the first light of day, the Count and I sit quietly together in my beautifully appointed chambers overlooking the Champs-Élysées. And if this tribunal won't believe me? They will believe you, Ade. You must have faith. Commander de Morcef is a national hero. He is also a murderer. Will you come with me to court? It will be better if you go on your own, but I shall be here waiting. Depend upon it. You are my most loving master. There is no need to address me so. But am I not your slave? In name alone. Away from you, I have no freedom. Surely the day must come when a child liberates herself from her parent, no matter how benign they may be. But you are not my parent, and I am very far from considering myself your child. I am not sure I take your meaning, a day. Will that traitorous devil, Fernando Mosef, at last pay for his crimes? Thanks to you, he will. Yes. Then my family will finally be avenged. Sleep now, child. And as the Count closes the door and descends to his study, another study door... Have you any idea what time it is, Commander? ...is opened. I do, Baron Danglars. Yes. But I have come to you on a matter of some urgency. Which is what, may I ask? The conversation you had with your good friend, the Count of Monte Cristo. Now, now, Fernand. No need for the tone. What on earth do you think you're doing? Focusing your attention, I hope. Have we not seen these two together before? In a small, dirty alley in the old port of Marseille? I don't know what it is you think I can do for you. I think you can publish a retraction of the accusations against me. I am merely the paper's proprietor, not its editor. Don't play me for a fool. Publish a retraction. Provide me with some evidence supporting your position and I will gladly do so. <laughs> Of course, they were both a little leaner then, a little hungrier. What did this Count of Monte Cristo tell you? <laughs> well? He merely mentioned, mentioned in passing, that he had heard tell of a high-ranking French officer being involved in the betrayal of Ali Pasha to the Turks. <laughs> we had our man out there do a little investigating. And... And... You know what you did, Fernand. <laughs> tribunal or no tribunal. <laughs> this isn't happening. You were always greedy. Even back when you were a nobody fisherman in Marseille, mooning over that peach Mercedes. I will make you pay for this. Mark my words. Oh, before you go. What? Regarding the wedding arrangements between your son Albert and my Eugenie, yeah, it might well be prudent for us to, given the circumstances, I don't know. Are you cancelling our agreement? Reputation, my dear Fernand. It's all about reputation. Madame de Morcerf. Monsieur. A great pleasure to see you once again, madame, and my thanks for a most diverting evening. I shall come straight to the point of my visit, if I may. Of course. My son. Yes? But watch, most honoured friends, as her resolve deserts her, as she is confronted now by those cold blue eyes, searching out, it seems, the deepest chasms of her heart. I believe my son was a friend to you. I still consider him so. And am I, then, by extension, a friend also, Count? I am at your service, madame. But are we friends? Observe them there together, eyes fixed steadily upon the other, as if each dares the other... Perhaps when we are a little better acquainted. ...to breathe. Are you sure I cannot offer you any refreshments, some coffee, perhaps? May I speak frankly? By all means. You have suffered greatly, I think. Suffered? 
in your life. You have lost attachments, perhaps loved ones. The point of your question, madame. But you are not unhappy now. My present happiness is on an equal par with my former disappointments. I am not sure I take your meaning. No. No. You are married, monsieur? I have not had that good fortune. You are unattached? I am. The girl who accompanied you yesterday, the girl who now gives evidence against my husband. My slave, a day. There was a girl, since you ask, a girl I once loved in Malta. Malta? Long time ago, 25 years. While I was unfortunately lost at sea, she discovered she loved another. It is an old song, often sung. Perhaps my youthful heart was not as resilient to disappointment as it might have been. And you are sure she found she loved another? As sure as you were standing there before me, madame. There could be no mistake. You have never thought to return to Malta to seek her out? No. And have you forgiven her? Her I have forgiven. Others, those who engineered our separation, I have not. But who could have engineered your separation? Did you not just say you were lost at sea? Did I? Spare my son's life, monsieur. It is he who has challenged me. Then I beg you. I need not remind you of the verdict of that stony-eyed tribunal. Thanks in no small part to the evidence I now give on this miserable Parisian afternoon. Father. Yes, Albert. What are you doing? I need not remind you of the public vilification heaped upon the house of the unmasked traitor Fernand de Morcerf. Arranging my affairs. Or of the warrant now issued for his immediate arrest. The girl who accompanied the Count last night. A day. What of her? Her evidence to the tribunal this afternoon. If you've something to say, boy. Is it true, father? The thing she accuses you of betrayal, treason. What do you think? I'm asking you. Whatever I did or did not do, I did for my family. Then the allegations are genuine. You really did betray the Sultan Ali Pasha, engineered the slaughter of his entire family. Oh, everything we have, everything I am, a lie. Goodbye. Answer me, Father. As I have already said, madame, the matter is out of my hands. Then you are resolved to duel with my son tomorrow morning. Honor demands it. The girl in Malta. What about her? Have you ever heard from her? She has long forgotten me. Did you never think to seek her out and ask her? I believe she married one of those who betrayed me. I have no idea what you're talking about, monsieur. I believe you, Madame de Morcerf. I do. The son cannot be held responsible for the crimes of his father. No matter how heinous, lose this duel. I beg you. Then you are asking me to die. We shall see. We shall see? A most pleasant visit, madame. Jacobo will show you out. I can find the door without him. Thank you. And I'm sorry. For what? For everything 
We have both lost. And as the sun sets on that dreadful day... Count! Our attention must journey... Am I to assume that you are Albert II, Monsieur Morel? I am. ...to the rising of the sun, as it illuminates those quiet banks of the Seine. Is he not with you? He must be delayed. I take it he has heard the tribunal's verdict against his father. One assumes so. We have met before, have we not? We have. At Albert's apartments. A happier rendezvous than this, I think. It was, I believe, your very first day in Paris. Morel, you say? Yes. Not at all related to Morel and sons of Marseille. Pierre Morel was my father. You knew him? Only by repute. He is well, I hope. He died some time ago. My sincere condolences. Thank you. Count, at last. You are late, monsieur. I must beg your forgiveness. Albert. There is no need to kneel. I have accused you falsely. Uh, you have me at a disadvantage. My father was, I believed, a soldier, a commander, above all, a man of honor. I believed all of these things of him without question. All of them. Uh, get up, Albert. But Please. I realize now that he is, in fact, a traitor. That my entire life has been based on an, on an infamous lie. It was never my intention to dishonor you, Count. Please, accept my sincere gratitude for all that you have done for me. Adieu. Wait, Albert. Wait! Paris, it seems, is in uproar. Disappeared. Almost without trace. Well, is he armed? I believe so. In that case, alert your best officers, initiate a manhunt. I want the traitor, Fernand de Morcef, standing before me in the dock this afternoon. Are we really not taking anything with us, Mama? Nothing. But what will become of the house? The, the, the furniture? The state will take it all in compensation for your father's crimes. And father? Is a wanted man. We must do our best to forgive him. Where will we go? Home. To Marseille. Mother, wait. Yes? I hope you will not be too disappointed in me. Whatever's happened? I have accepted a commission with the Dragoons. The Dragoons? My mind is quite made up. How else is the good name of de Morcerf ever to be reclaimed? In that case, what choice do I have? God bless you, Mother. And thank you. Now, I would very much like to leave this house. Monte Cristo! Leave... And never return. Monte Cristo. Commander de Morcerf. He just barged in here, sir. Thank you, Jacopo. That will be all. Shall I not alert the authorities? Not just at this second, no. But I... I... That will be all, Jacopo. May I offer you some brandy, Commander? Brandy? Or wine? Are you mocking me? No. I trust your wife and son are well. My wife and son have abandoned me. I'm sorry to hear that. Are you? Are you really? I am. You see, I very much wanted to see for myself the face of the man who has actively sought to destroy me. In order for you to accomplish that, you need only find yourself a looking glass. What did you say? I said you need only find yourself a looking glass. You know that I could kill you where you stand? I know that you could try. Is that a threat? It is a simple statement of fact. Do you know who I am? All too well. I assume your man has gone to alert the authorities. A day was barely eight years old when I bought her. A child in a dirty cage. Your little slave girl testified against me in open court. Lied. Do stop deluding yourself, Fernand. You dare to address me by my Christian name? I do. Then again, you have me at a disadvantage, monsieur. Do you really not know me? Of course I don't know you. I think perhaps your wife may have recognized me. Mercedes was here. She is still as beautiful as she ever was, isn't she? 
What business have you with my wife? To think that we were engaged to be married once upon a time. Dantes. Edmund. Dantes. You seem surprised. This is a trick. A jest. Fourteen years in the Chateau de oh, Get away from me! Ignored, forgotten, left to die. And all thanks to a piece of paper falsely denouncing me as a traitor to the authority. It was Dongla. Dongla, who wrote that note? And you, who delivered it. How could you know that? I know what occurred in Marseille that night in every particular thing. That Edmond Dantes is dead. Dead. Really? How could how can this be happening? How? <laughs> and now, at last, you know what it is to have everything you have ever loved taken away from you. <laughs> I could kill you. I could. <laughs> this pistol's loaded. Hard to kill a dead man, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I'd imagine your execution will attract quite a crowd, don't you? <laughs> You'll be the talk of all Paris. <laughs> Dongla. Dongla and I will meet in due course. You may depend upon it. Oh, help me. Don't, please. No. no. I cannot be arrested. The disgrace. There is no alternative. Unless. Unless. You hold the solution in the palm of your hand. Goodbye for now. Oh. Oh, you don't want to watch me die? I believe I already have. The first blossoms of spring tumble every which way along the bright and airy boulevards of the always magnificent Paris, heralding at last the first stir of summer as they flutter hopelessly against the locked and shuttered windows of the house of the traitor de Morcerf who even now, most honored friends, raises a gleaming silver pistol to his forehead. <laughs> and now a single shot in a darkened room echoes along every shadowy street and alley until its reverberations reach even the oh so beautifully decorated apartments of one of the most desired addresses in Paris. My dear Count. Baron Dongla, what an absolute delight. That came as soon as I heard. Heard? Uh, that the traitor de Morcerf was here in this very room. A matter best forgotten. Uh, dangerous man, de Morcerf. Ruthless. Always was. Well, he's quite dead now, is he not? With a pistol given him by the king, apparently. The irony. Was there some other reason for your visit, Baron Dongla? Uh, it's not that it isn't always a pleasure, but... Uh... Uh, well, yes, Count. Actually, there was. You see, now that Albert de Morcerf has left Paris in disgrace, well, obviously, my beautiful daughter Eugenie is suddenly no longer... Affianced. Affianced. My point is, the young man you mentioned when we discussed extending you the credit of my bank. Your ward. And... And... and Andrea Cavalcanti. The very fellow. What about him? I wondered if he might not be a more suitable suitor for my Eugenie. Why, the same thought had actually crossed my mind. It had? Do you doubt me? Oh, th this is news without compare, sir. Without compare? Well, we must meet the boy as soon as is possible. Well, you surely don't imagine that I will provide you with a date this instant, Baron. Oh, of course not, my dear Count. Perish the thought. It... It's just that my wife and I are keen to know you so very much better. Oh, you will come to know me better, Baron. Depend upon it. Good. 
Marvellous. Oh, and, um, I take it the credit I afforded to you is quite sufficient for your needs? Perfectly so. Ah. In that case, I shall, uh... Indeed. Au revoir. Eh. As Paris settles into early summer and streetlights hiss into golden light, a carriage, resolute as death, now pulls up outside the Count's apartments. Maltese. Yes, Jacopo. Looks like you have another visitor. Crown prosecutor Gerard de Vifor. I see. It's a long Maltese. I just thought... Well, thank you, old friend, but it's nothing I cannot deal with. And I trust you were satisfied with how we brought Madame de Villefort's carriage down. It was, of course, expertly done. Not a scratch to man or beast. Mm. Still got a trick or two up my sleeve, don't I? We shall take a pipe of hashish together later, I hope. Certainly. Now, we'd best not delay the crime prosecutor any longer than we have to. Breathing softly. Oh, so very softly. Observe the Count as he looks into the mirror above the fire and does not see in its brilliant reflection an exquisitely furnished room. Repeat it back to me, Dantes. All of it. But instead a dungeon, dark and buried deep in the bowels... But I understand it, Abbe Faria. ...of the Chateau d'If. Repeat it. But what if you're wrong? What if they did not betray me? Then you're a fool, Edmund, and deserve to rot here. I say it. Fenon and Dongla betrayed me. Their motives? Fenon for Mercedes, for lust, and Dongla for my position on the Ferron. Good. You're learning at last. But still, de Villefort's reason for imprisoning me here is unclear. He was prosecutor for Marseille, a man of responsibility and trust. And let us analyze him again. But we have already analyzed them over and over and over. And we'll continue to do so until we have discovered the meaning behind his actions. Now, you say on the night of your arrest, you had a letter to deliver. Yes. A letter addressed to whom? To a General Noitier. Noitier, Noitier. Ah, think, Maria, think. Ah, of course. Oh, what, old friend? Don't you see, Dantes? What here is the key? The key to what? Your undoing. My undoing? Yes, Jacopo. Monsieur Gerard de Villefort, crime prosecutor. Thank you, Jacopo. That will be all. Count. Monsieur... Count of Monte Cristo. An honor, sir. Well, I thought it only right and proper that I, Gerard de Villefort, Crown Prosecutor of Paris, come to your house and formally thank you for the kindness you demonstrated my family in their hour of need. Monsieur de Villefort, the satisfaction of preserving the life of a child and not sundering that most sacred of bonds which exists between a mother and her son relieved you of any obligation to visit me today. You are too gracious. Then let us say no more about it. Geography. I'm sorry? Well, the maps on the wall there, is it an interest? I'm more interested in humanity. You're a philosopher? As you were a crown prosecutor. Now, tell me, please, is that a title worth having? I beg your pardon? Because for my part, I'm damned if I can see any kind of use for it. Well, they say you have travelled widely, Count. The East? Yes. And perhaps those cultures do not quite comprehend our subtle systems of French justice. They understand an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Ask Fernand de Morcerf. De Morcerf took his own life and so escaped rightful prosecution. But in taking his own life has not God's justice most surely been done? <sighs> You've not been in Paris long, have you, Count? Long enough. And in that room of shadow and silence, another room starts to appear to the Count. Dantes. They say your name is Dantes. That is correct, sir. A room not seen in over 25 years. And you were arrested when? Not one hour ago, at my marriage feast. A room in Marseille. Now, according to this document, you are apparently a fanatical Bonapartist, actively engaged in plans to return the disgraced emperor back to power. I'm what? 
Well, is that not why you have been denounced? Denounced? You sound surprised. It's true that I delivered a package to Elba on behalf of the captain of the Ferron, of which I am first mate. To Elba? And did you see Bonaparte? I did, sir, but only for an instant. And what was in this package? I've no idea. Well, you have an honest look about you, don't you? Because everything, in every particular, I say is true, sir. Well, now, think carefully before you answer this. Is there anything you have about your person which might incriminate you in any way? I have this letter, sir, addressed to one General Noitier. Repeat that name, please. Noitier? General Noitier? Are you acquainted with the gentleman, sir? Have you had any personal dealings with General Noitier? None whatsoever, until a week ago. I, I never even heard of him. Right. The letter, please. Sir? Have you opened this letter? Tampered with it in any way? No, sir. Would it surprise you to know that this letter proves that there is a very real plot to restore the traitor Napoleon as Emperor of France? What? Hmm? As well as timely warnings to those closely associated with the intrigue? It would, sir, completely. Oh. Here is what I am going to do for you, Dantes. First of all, I'm going to burn this letter. A letter you are going to forget you ever had in your possession, is that clear? It is forgotten already. And then I'm going to instruct the guards to take you to the Chateau d'If, where... The Chateau d'If? Where you will be held for your safety until I have discovered who has acted so mendaciously against you. Oh. I shall get to the bottom of this, Monsieur Dantes. You have my solemn word on it. Sergeant. Sir. I'm finished with this prisoner. Very good, sir. You give my compliments to the governor of the Deef, and you tell him that in this regard, NATBT, he'll understand. NATBT. Very good, sir. Now, the sergeant here, he'll take good care of you. Thank you, monsieur. Thank you. We shall meet again under more pleasant circumstances, I hope. I hope so, too, sir. I hope so, too, sir. Perhaps I might offer you some refreshment, Monsieur de Villefort, some brandy? As the Count stares at the thin-drawn man who stands so censoriously before him, it seems inconceivable that he could ever have been so naive as to... Thank you, no. ...believe him. Then perhaps, as an officer of the law, you can help me with an abbreviation I came across some years ago in an old legal document. Yes, yes gladly. Trust him. N-A-T. B-T. Ah, it was an informal code we used years ago. No action to be taken. It was generally used to signify men who were perceived to be dangerous political activists. Anti-monarchists. Bonapartists. Bonapartists, especially. Fanatics to a man, every one. Thank you. You have been most helpful. Am I to understand that you do have some interest in our judicial system, after all? Although I consider myself to be above all human law, yes. Above all law? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm quite with you. There are certain men whose personalities have been so fashioned by fate and destiny. Men who accurately perceive the sacred truth of justice and answer only to the greatest and most magnificent judge of all. And who might that be? Why, God himself. And do you consider yourself to be such a man? I do. <laughs> I see. I see that it amuses you to make sport of me. Not by any means. Well, I thank you once again for the great service you did my wife and child, sir. It's been a most fascinating conversation. Good evening. There is one more thing I would ask your father... Yes. His name is Noitier, isn't it? General Noitier. May I ask why this is of interest? I heard he was a brave and noble commander. Your information is correct. For a Bonapartist. The somewhat misguided political views of my father are well documented. But you do not share them? And never have. Is that why you change your name? Is there something that you wish to share with me, Count? Only that I hope... You and your wife will do me the honor of visiting me at my country house. We shall await your invitation keenly, Count. 
And as the Crown Prosecutor stiffly bows his head... Monsieur. That same, once fearless, General Noirtier, father to de Villefort, loyal supporter of the long-dead Emperor Napoleon, is being fed some cold soup. Oh, it's no good you kicking up so, Father. Can't let you starve, can we? Yeah. And it's parsnip, your favourite. From a wooden spoon. No! <laughs> he who, as we know, most honoured friends... Stroke or no stroke, you're not above good manners, General. ...sits alone in a dusty attic. No! <laughs> Very well, then. We shall wait until Monsieur de Villefort returns from visiting the Count of Monte Cristo, and you can tell him why you have refused to eat. Cristo! I just told you all about him. The man who saved young Edward and I from certain death. Do you not listen to a word I say? Valentine! Your granddaughter is in her room. Tin! Some soup first. There it goes. Well done. And open. I must say, the house will certainly be quiet when Valentine is finally off our hands and married. Married? Yes, General, married. <coughs> to Franz Depigny, no less. Depigny! Such a well connected family. Aristocratic. <coughs> oh, 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 Monsieur! <coughs> Liar! Liar! I shall fetch your son, I shall. <coughs> Valentine! <coughs> Valentine! You can explain your disgusting behaviour to him. Secrets. <coughs> Paris is all about secrets. Valentine! Over here, my love! And in the quietest corner of de Villefort's somewhat gloomy garden, another... I have counted the hours. ...is to be discovered on either side of an old garden wall. If only I could hold you in my arms and kiss you. Don't say it, my love. Oh, then let me climb over. No, you mustn't. Listen, Maximilian. There is a terrible rumour. What rumour? I am to be engaged to Franz Depigny. Depigny? You know him. I do, and he's a fool. Valentine! That's my stepmother. You must go. I cannot bear it. Where are you, you silly girl? Go! Until tomorrow, my love. There you are. Did you not hear me calling? I was just so much... In future... Will you come when you are called for? It's no good you pulling faces, Father. Valentine is to be married to Franz Depigny, and there it is. Lawyer! Lawyer! What? Lawyer! A lawyer? Why? Disinherit! Disinherit who? Valentine! You would destroy your granddaughter's one opportunity for security and social advancement. Lawyer! The Depigny family have one of the oldest and most respected names in France, and weren't you and he allies? <laughs> That's enough, Father! <laughs> now, your wishes regarding who inherits this family's wealth will, of course, be respected and honoured. If you'll excuse me. Valentine! Valentine! <laughs> Come. You wanted to see me, Father? I did, Valentine. For some time now, your stepmother and I have considered your, your future happiness. Thank you, Father. And to that end, we've had the good fortune to engineer a match between yourself and the Depigny family. I see. Ah, I wanted to be the first to share this happy news with you. May I ask if you are resolved on pursuing this course of action? You may, and I am. Are you crying? No, Father. Oh, dear child. It is for the best, I promise you. Come. Have you told Valentine the good news, Gerard? I have. Is it not good news, Valentine? It is, I suppose. You suppose? You, you may go to your room, Valentine. Thank you, Father, stepmother. 
Straight to bed, mind. She's so willful. You might be kinder, Eloise. Kinder? Well, the girl has a lot to adjust to. We should arrange a meeting with Monsieur Depenier just as soon as we can. Agreed. Perhaps after we have visited the Count of Monte Cristo at his new house in Otoy. At? He told me about it this afternoon. Apparently it's haunted. Sorry, his house where? Otoy. Rue de la Fontaine. Story goes that these two young lovers buried their baby in his garden and one can still hear its ghostly cries in the night. He told you this? What a remarkable character the Count is. Which number, Rue de la Fontaine? Which number? Yeah, which number? <laughs> well, no, look, why can't you just answer the question? 28. D didn't your late wife's parents have a house at that address? They did. Yes, they did. Are you all right, Gerard? Look as though you've seen a ghost yourself. Oh, forgive me, Eloise. It's, it's been a long and difficult day. Are you sure you don't want me to call no, a doctor? I am positive, thank you. Thank you. Extraordinary, the coincidence, no? Extraordinary. <laughs> Wednesday, most honoured friends. A fire on my hand! You're standing on my hand! Benedetto Benedetti. Who wants to know? Is your name Benedetto Benedetti? Yes, yes! Now, Benedetto Benedetti, may I assume I have your full attention? The world turns on a Wednesday.